Welcome to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to a live breaking news Surviving the Survivor event. Uh, happy Monday morning to everybody as we get back into the week. And uh, this morning, we are expecting Shanna Gardner to uh, reappear inside a Jacksonville uh, courthouse, Jacksonville, Florida courthouse. Uh, we may or may not be uh, joined by uh, Shannon Schott, who is a Jacksonville attorney. Uh, just trying to get a hold of her on this Monday morning. Um, Shannon Schott works with Belkis Plata. They are criminal defense attorneys out of uh, Jacksonville. Shannon Schott was raised in, in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, went to the University of Florida, where she graduate, graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science with a certification in Public Affairs, and went on to Stetson University College of Law, and she has been uh, on us uh, discussing this case before. So uh, we are hoping to have her. Um, this hearing is uh, set to kick off at 9 a.m. Eastern time sharp. So we'll see if that in fact happens. And uh, First Coast News out of Jacksonville, Florida is the pool camera. So we are uh, waiting to uh, behind the scenes here, keeping an eye on it. Uh, again, she's supposed to show up and likely uh, with her um, co-defendant right now, Mario Fernandez Saldana. And I love early morning shows because we get people like Elena Bonilla Abad, uh, who is coming to us from Spain, and uh, Asta here, who is coming to us from Iceland. So truly a uh, global audience. And then uh, Susan Harmon in Jacksonville. Uh, she's been helping us out behind the scenes, watching from her living room, even more exotic. So uh, happy to have her as well. There is um, some news with this case. We're finding out that uh, last week um, there was a new court order filed uh, in regards to this case about whether or not the state attorney's office fourth judicial judicial circuit will remain on the uh, high profile prosecution of Shanna Gardner or will they be kicked off? So this has been a big point that the defense has been making and uh, welcome to Dorothy in Miami um, where I am coming to you from uh, this morning. But um, there has been, there have been arguments made, and Chris, Christy King coming to us from Australia, there have been arguments made by the defense here to have the entire prosecution team removed from this case. Um, and we'll get to why in a moment. But Judge London Kite, uh, who has command uh, a presence over this over these proceedings and over this courtroom, uh, she now says that she is vacating any and all orders from the special master. That special master is a person named Judge Robert Foster. And instead of having him on the case to help decide this, she will instead directly address the matter. Uh, the defense teams have argued that the state attorney's office mishandled attorney-client privilege uh, and specifically some communications, letting it become public. And so, therefore, they should be uh, removed. And it looks like Shannon Schott is here. Let me bring her in. Hey, Shannon, how are you? Good. Good morning. Thanks good for morning. having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it very much. And I was just going over this. is set to start in just uh, a... Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I'm going to bounce that out for one sec. I'm going to keep an eye on it. But Shannon, that is a live look this morning at uh, the courtroom in Jacksonville, uh, yeah. getting ready uh, for Shanna Gardner's um, hearing. And I will bring it back up, but uh, just muted here. Um, 
And so that is that beautiful. Uh, I'm going to get muted right now just till we get the proceeding started here. Um, but we Shannon, Dreiser, hold on. I'm court. sorry. We got Jesse Dreiser, the attorney for Mario Fernandez, right here in the front. Mm -hmm. Who else is in? I saw Alan Mizrahi. So looks like they're getting ready to go. Yeah, and Dreiser's here on the on the right hand side of the screen, correct? Correct. He's right. His back's to us. Yeah, and he's talking to uh, someone but there. Shannon, um, oh my gosh, I don't know her name right now, but it's one of the associates in his firm. She's an attorney, also. Okay, and there they are, and they are uh, ready for this uh, hearing this morning. What I was telling STS Nation is that there was a uh, court order filed last week about this whole idea of getting basically uh, rid of the prosecution team, uh, the state attorney's uh, office, mm -hmm. fourth judicial circuit, um, whether or not they should stay on this high profile case. Now, Judge London Kite came out and said she's vacating any and all orders from the special master. The special master is a judge named Robert Foster and instead, she is going to directly address this matter. Uh, any idea why suddenly she's saying, no, I'll handle this. Uh, we don't need a special judge in this case. I mean, so Judge Foster is a senior judge. Um, you know, he's not in it as much as London's in it. Um, I, I had lunch with London's JA actually on Friday. Mm. And, you know, this is just so, this case has affected our legal community and our community so much that I think for the purposes of the record and when this case ultimately gets appealed, which it will be appealed, she wants to make sure that the judge who heard all the testimony, who was involved with everything, um, is the one who made all the rulings. And if she's wrong, fine. But she didn't. I'm sure she just didn't want it delegated or left to someone else. You know, just to make sure that the record's really clear. And here is Judge London Kite. Let's listen in here together. Here comes Mario Fernandez Saldana. And you're on all way, Ms. Gardner's parents this morning. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I'm assuming that you both got the order that I entered. Yes, okay, so since I'm taking um, the review back, what I'd like to know is. I'm not sure what got provided to Judge Foster um, on behalf of the defense, and I'm going to address uh, Fernandez separately um, because I believe that there are separate issues related to both. Okay, so um, Mr. Dreischler, do you want me to get the materials from Judge Foster, or do you want to provide me something different? I am. Perfectly okay with everything we gave Judge Foster. You were doing. Okay. Um. With the understanding, I think everyone. I just like to start that. It, in no way are we waiving the attorney-client privilege by allowing you to review it. You know, there could be some argument made that, well, if they said they were perfectly fine with you reviewing it, then it's broke. That it's with the understanding that we're making some exception for court review, right? It was more clear with Judge Foster, but um, having said that, yes, everything that Judge Foster has um, is unredacted. The state has it in a redacted format, and I believe it was filed in a redacted format. I'll double check that it was supposed to be filed. Um, if it hasn't been, we'll make sure that gets done so that there's some record as to like dates and times, so whatever your ruling is would be reflected um, on a, a court docket. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, to the extent, let me, so there are two documents that the state has um, that are both titled confidential communication, correct? Confidential communication, confidential timeline. Okay. And they're attached to the emails back and forth between my client and our office 
Just and there's 66 emails, correct? Well, let me kind of just go a little slower. There are the attachments, and then there are emails that discuss the attachments, which will be enlightening for the court to understand how they came to be and why they came to be and what they serve some purpose for. They're attached to the, um, where you can see the attachments, and then of course we attach the attachments in a physical copy. That's one portion. That's what we initially delivered to Judge Foster. Then there is 60 some odd miscellaneous emails, which I believe all of them are titled in the subject line, confidential communication. And there are a variety of subjects over a, a many months, if not over a, a year period of time. And the only, and I'll say that, and then whether or not, and, and our position is, and I think the state would at least acknowledge, they had access to all of those, they just maintain that they've never seen them. Okay. Dr. Lyon one sixty three, your honor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do you think that there is any need for me to look at these, I, I will say category B, these 60 miscellaneous emails, if the state of Florida is saying that they did not, well, they had access to it on you. Do you think there's a need for me to look at those? I think yes, to understand the, the case law as to whether or not you may determine to disqualify the office versus individual lawyers within the office, um, I think you have to understand that those emails all were able to be accessed via not only Next Point by Lindsey Butler and various other law enforcement. Um, you have to at least look at them to understand that. Whether you have to read them, like the, the body of them, I, I, don't, I don't know that you do, right? right? But you just have to understand that they exist and then understand that if, if the evidence were to show that they did have access to them, I think you are gonna have to consider that in your evaluation. All right. And this was all provided to Judge Foster? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And there's nothing that needs to be supplemented from the defense perspective? No, no ma'am. All right. Does the state agree? Yes, the other than the one document entitled Confidential Conversation. And the other one's titled, entitled Confidential Timeline. Other than that, yes. Okay. All right, um, let me address Barger now. Mr. Curry, I believe that my understanding at the last hearing was that you did not want me to reach the substance of the communications. And my understanding from your pleadings is that um, there were, I guess, um, these devices where search warrants were served and then um, it was divided out amongst uh, detectives to review the search warrant results and you were still, I guess, gathering or figuring out what was actually in these terabytes of the Google, whatever that was, and in the iCloud. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. So <clears throat> our motion uh, rest more on the substantial misconduct prong as opposed um, to the other prong with which required a showing of prejudice. The misconduct prong does not. Um, but we do not have any objection uh, to the court reviewing what we provided um, Judge Foster to date. And uh, what did you provide? Yes, Your Honor. I, we provided um, several uh, recordings that were, one was a phone call, there were a couple of voicemails, um, and then some emails and text messages. It was not substantial, Judge, um, but we do believe it's important that the, that the court review those just to be able to make the conclusion that there were, in fact, attorney-client communications on these devices. Okay. 
Is there anything um, in addition that the state wants me to consider related to the Garner case? I'm understanding Mr. Curry's allegations at this point. I think last court day we conceded the state did not receive any of these communications, but there was some mishandling of them because a warrant was procured for her iPhone return after the devices were sent to the So I think the warrant and warrant affidavit for the iCloud would be relevant. And we intend to provide that and other documents to the court. I didn't. I, I never said the state didn't review um, everything. They did, in fact. We know that the state did, in fact, or prosecution did, in fact, review communications between the attorney-client that were covered by the attorney-client privilege because the agent or analyst reviewing them reached out to Miss Stifler saying, "Hey, I think I'm reviewing attorney-client communications." So. We know that the state, right, their whole team did, in fact, review attorney-client communications. So it's not what we're saying. We provide that. We provide what we have. We don't know what exactly was reviewed by the analyst. Um, Why not? Because we did not ask that specifically. Uh, we did not want to air it in the in, in the deposition because, you know, that, that was our opportunity to speak to the analyst. and. We confirmed that she did, in fact, review materials between Ms. Gardner and her attorneys. Uh, we just don't know exactly what those detail, th those detail. <clears throat> On that note, Your Honor, uh, we did not discuss, but it's, I think now is the right time. The state and I uh, and Mr. Crody on behalf of Ms. Gardner, agreed that Judge Foster could read the depositions that we took and we provided him transcripts. Um, and, and I believe, unless the state had, there's now in your head, we all maintain that uh, you, I request that you read those. Okay. How many did you provide? Two. Uh, Agent Nazario from uh, the Secret Service and Laura Butler, an analyst, excuse me, Lindsay, excuse me, Lindsay Butler, an analyst from ATF. And we would agree with that, Your Honor. And we will supplement it and provide you additional documents, the warrants, the, the court order from Judge Carbola. We're not going to provide that. I can provide it this week, Your Honor. Okay. By Wednesday, with copy to the state. And I don't know if this is necessary. At the deposition of Ms. Butler, she testified, everyone was present, that. She began reviewing an iCloud return. She observed a message she couldn't recall from an attorney and was interviewed from a client. She alerted the state. My response was shut it down, send it out, stop reviewing. So what she my view of her depot transcript or her depot testimony was she saw one communication. Mr. Cruddy did not ask what that communication was, but if they need to know what it is, certainly Ms. Butler, I can arrange for her to speak to them outside the presence of the state or in camera with the court to let them know the one message that she did view or see or realize was, was on that. But we haven't reviewed anything. She didn't tell me the content of the message or provide it to me, so I have no idea what it is. But I don't know, because she's now out of state, if they're requesting her to give any kind of testimony regarding this issue in camera or otherwise, I can make arrangements for that as well. One of the, um, just so that we're clear that there is no guessing, why don't we have that done this week? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And just so I'm clear, the idea would be for in camera for you to talk to her in camera. No. Okay. For just the defense to interview her with you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it a record. I'm gonna seal it. You can ask her. Um, the question that the questions that you need to understood on the record in front of the your honor correct understood and then um oh we'll do it here in court i'll close the proceedings in camera um you can make it record i'll seal the transcript okay yes sir and i will not be present for that yes that's correct and i know this is so confusing because you haven't seen this stuff yet that whole dialogue between the state and mr Crowley and what uh, Lindsay Butler saw or didn't see is totally separate than the two issues that I have that she did see and said, okay? So I'm, you're reading I'm it. I'm very, I mean, to me, Fernandez is a, 
his case and the issues presented are a similar issue in my mind um, because the state as saying that they have access to it, they said that, that was my understanding that you all were saying it was evidence, not a jury client privilege. So um, that's to me a simpler issue to resolve. At this point, I don't want any guessing. I want to be able to, for you to be able to identify um, the information accurately so that you can make whatever arguments you need to, and then I can review whatever you believe would be necessary for me to make a decision. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, when do you think you can have contact with this witness? I can call her when I leave court. She is out of state, so she either have to travel or the resume. Do you have any problems with Zoom testimony? No, Your Honor, not for that purposes. Would be a lot easier to get yeah, not not for purposes of this issue. Okay. So, don't forget, we're still going to have you know I'm not involved. You still have to go through the whole two-week process. The AUSA is going to have to approve it. He's going to have, you're going to have to specifically say what you're asking her to do. The AUSA is that who she is, a special agent? She's an analyst at ATS. Yes, she does need to be let her. It was not my problem last time. I think even with the. I'm not, it, I'm not suggesting it's a problem. It's just a process. It takes a process. There's right. a difference. I understand how TV works. Um, if, they, if Mr. Curry can get me a letter today or tomorrow, I think we should be able to issue Your Honor, I can get her a letter before close of business today. So it's something that needs to be arranged next week? Let me speak to her today, and I can let the parties know by email if I get it done this week. Where is she out of state? Washington, D.C. Do you want to hold off on the materials? I'm going to push forward with Hernandez, okay? Since I, it seems like I have everything. And so, um, based on, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to separate the two. Um, Y'all aren't going to be appearing for these hearings together, unless, you know, the attorneys want to come, but I'm not going to have this guard or president for Hernandez because the issues are separate. Um, the attorney-client privilege is separate in the, even, Ms. Garner's attorney should not have any access to that information. So I'm going to separate these hearings. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to Judge, I guess the only exception would be if that we are going to take the testimony of Agent Nazario and, and Lindsey Butler on the record. I know we're going to provide you on with the depositions, but that may be something that we would want to do together. Why? Why would we want to do it together? Right. So that we don't did have. She, did she have some involvement? Well, I thought you asked the questions you had during that position. Yeah. I think I flushed out my issue without ever addressing the specifics. I think if I. If you want I, to ask questions. I don't think I need to. I really. I'm not sure that I need to. I, I think the transcript you have answers the questions you'll need to answer. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, I, I, if the court's going to accept the transcripts and use those as substantive evidence that, for the motions, then I don't believe we'll need to recall these witnesses in person. Um, except for? Except for the ex parte in camera. Okay. Do y'all have any problem with that? No. All right, I'm going to agree. Yes, Your Honor. It's okay. How long do you all think the hearings should take? Let's separate out um, for Mr. Fernandez's case. I'm sorry, I was talking. What was the question? I was asking how long do you think the hearing would take? I'm going to. Well, I'm going to defer to the past. How much are I going to have to stay? From our perspective, it will be very brief. Our last pre trial. On this issue was 40 minutes so uh, I I want to say argument you'll have seen everything two, two to three hours and maybe I'm way long but I these are complicated issues how about um 
April 6th, I'm sorry, April 26th uh, for Fernandez, and I'll give y'all the whole morning for non-digging. Touch on out. Yeah. 25th and 26th. Okay. I filled up my morning with BOP hearings and a 30 That's perfect. I'm free. I'm free. I, I have a, a mediation that was set for that entire day. If I, if I had to move it, I guess I could if there was no other choice. No. Okay, so at this point, it's the 19th in the afternoon. I have a BOP hearing on May 3rd, but I'll move that. Um, and I can give y'all the entire morning. May 3rd would be great uh, for the defense, right? Yes, sir. May 3rd. And did you say morning or afternoon? All morning. All morning. So from 9 to 12, you all have the um, course time. All right, so case number four. The next court date will be May 3rd, 9 a.m., hearing on motion. And if you would put it in the notes, Mr. Hathaway, four hours. Yes, ma'am. And, Your Honor, if, I'm sorry, I broke that three hours. If, uh, for whatever reason, I can't imagine this is the case, but for whatever reason, Judge Foster marked up and you want clean copies or whatever, just have your JA reach out to us and we can get it to you right away. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we also, both the state and the defense, the only thing that wasn't mentioned is there's some case law that was provided, and, and please review that as well for both. Okay. And uh, with that, may we be excused? Yes, thank you very much. Thanks. All right, um, Mr. Curry. Judge, we would ask for that 419 afternoon. Your Honor, I understand. I want to correct myself. In regards to Ms. Gardner's motion, that was a motion to dismiss the charge that she had filed in the motion to dismiss the charge myself um, to clarify some of the issues regarding the access if that's what their substantial misconduct allegation rests on. I think we really need to have a separate testimony on that aspect. Now that we have their motion for the position. I don't anticipate it'll be lengthy, but I did want to keep this on the Okay. this case uh, later on the same week. I want to know, I want an answer on the 2 week issue, how long that will take in order for this agent to appear. Um, so I'm thinking maybe Wednesday if you could have the 2 week information to the state. Yes, Judge. All right. Uh, and then I'll schedule the hearing after I know. So in my mind, this is going to be a scheduling course. We're going to get an answer on Tui this week. Then um, we will schedule the in-camera hearing. All right, maybe a portion. I'll have a seat here just in case something comes up or there's some kind of issue. I'll ask that you step outside, um, take the testimony of the agent, and then, um, then I will give you a pass date for the actual hearing. Okay, on the defense motion. Judge, so um, all the attorneys for Ms. Gardner are available on 419. We also have the outstanding bond motion. So I do have concerns that if we keep pushing this and pushing this and pushing this, mm -hmm. I understand the, that the court is doing, you know, what I, I agree with as far as the, the order of events. I'm just wondering if we can compress them um, and it maybe hold the 19th as a placeholder I'm fine. Okay. Um, I'm fine doing the 19th as like a stop time, but I need to have the information. So, and I'm not going to go based on a guess by the defense. Like these are serious allegations. Yes, Judge. So I need to identify, you know, what you want me to review. Okay. So we'll do. We can do one to five on the 19th. If you would walk that time, I will walk it. Okay? Thank you, Your Honor. So, in Shannon Barner's case, case number six, 
We'll set the following dates. April 10th, 9 a.m. That would be a status hearing. I have time. I should have time next week. Um, or even this week, if we if you can get her and she's available on Thursday, I do the afternoon on Thursday, okay, to have this in camera hearing. If she's available. Correct. And then we will I'm just saying that as a potential date that you can throw out for her. I should not be in trial. We can have this hearing. I don't think that will take that long. Then so we'll have April 19, 1 p.m. Here in the motion. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. May I have an excuse? Yes, thank you. There you have it. A lot of uh, legal wrangling. Uh, Tim Jansen in the car. Um, but first to Shannon. Uh, Shannon, what is the uh, headline of uh, this morning's hearing? Probably just judge doesn't make a decision pushed for further for further investigation. I mean, you heard all the coordination with the different hearings that they're going to have. And um, Judge Kite was really trying to figure out when she could get this done as quickly as possible. And interestingly, they have different arguments. So she's going to hear these in two separate hearings. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, they're going to have two separate hearings. From what I understand, um, Shanna Gardner's hearing will now be April 19th uh, for this. And mm -hmm. uh, Mario Fernandez Saldana will be May 3rd. Tim Jansen, thank you for joining us. Um, basically, what's going on here, and you can explain it a lot better than me, is the defense is arguing that the state got their hands on confidential material that they basically disseminated within the state attorney's office, and therefore the defense says that the state should be um, removed from the case. And they even brought in um, a special magistrate, a special um, judge, uh, but now um, Judge London Kite says she's going to handle everything. Why is this like so protracted? Why is this taking so long, Tim? Uh, it doesn't seem like we even got to the meat and potatoes today. We just rehashed what we rehashed last time, knowing that now Judge London Kite is going to be looking at this. Why? Well, I think she's pretty methodical. She wanted to make sure she wasn't going to do anything to get herself recused from the case. She may have spoken to the chief judge. She may have now gotten a little more information from these participants, what the information is. Um, the TUI issue is, is a, it's not a problematic, but it can be a pain in the rear. Uh, anytime you have a federal employee and you want to subpoena them to a court case, um, you have to provide the justice department, the questions, the areas that you're going to ask, the, ex the exact questions because they can uh, withhold that witness because of ongoing investigations. So you have to provide this letter and it's hard to get them to do it. It's time consuming. Um, you hate to give it up because then you know that the other side's gonna get your questions, your theories. Um, TUI can be a problem for defense lawyers and that's what they're trying to do with this employee, get the TUI letter out so they can get approval to take this deposition of this employee. Uh, and then they're going to provide that deposition to the court. And then the court's got to review it before they have the hearing. I think the judge is smart by, you know, like you do in carpentry, measure twice, cut once. I think she's trying to do it methodically and making sure she doesn't make a mistake that she gets recused. Um, so it may be a little bit of nothing. Um, but if there was attorney client information and it was used in a grand jury, that could jeopardize an indictment. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, you are looking at Jared Bride again. He is the reason we are all here. He is the ex-husband of Shanna Gardner, um, who was murdered in alleged uh, murder for hire plot. And one of the, the trigger man, Henry Tennant, has come forward uh, and will likely turn state's witness here. So um, 
will be it will be an uphill battle, I think, for the defense. But um, Shannon, um, again, they're talking about. And by the way, it, it appears, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Shannon Gardner waived her appearance. Is that how you understand it? Yeah, so they've been dressing her out for court because they've talked about how they don't want her to be prejudiced by the media having her in shackles and in her um, jail clothes. So I think it was just too short of a hearing to justify dressing her out. It's very time consuming to do that. It's very complicated. So that's my understanding why they would have just waived her appearance instead. Hmm. Uh, Tim, there was an interesting question. I think it was from KCL, who's on top of everything, um, mm -hmm. asking... Is, it, is there the possibility that Judge London M. Kite could be prejudiced by looking at some of these confidential documents, reportedly confidential documents, and then presiding over the same case? What about that? Well, that's true. It could be. I thought I heard Fernandez's lawyer waiving that, um, but I'm not sure if that's correct for the other defendant. Um, it is a problem. Um, because you can't have attorney-client privilege. That's the whole reason they want to recuse the office, because it's unfair that they're going to know the defense strategies. So what you can't have a prosecutor knowing that. You certainly can't have a judge knowing that. And I think that's why she originally wanted the chief judge to make those determinations, uh, whether they were in attorney-client privilege and whether it was prejudicial. So I don't know if the judge now feels because Fernandez waived it. She feels comfortable. She's not going to put herself in a position. But I don't know about Saldano. Hmm. And Shannon, to you, they came out, uh, the defense did, and said, look, there are these attachments and then emails that discuss the attachments of this confidential client attorney privilege and then went on to say that there's something like 60 miscellaneous emails entitled confidential over a year, a year period, period of time, of time. Uh, there's uh, no there's way, no way that, that i'm getting it getting 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 but there's no but there's way no that all three of those, those are part of this issue, issue. But, but but why bring, why all, bring all that up, that up again? again sorry, sorry there's, there's, there's an oh, oh, oh. I'm not, I'm not sure why, why. Yeah. um so um, so they, 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 we've got a we've situation, got a situation where, where they need the judge to understand what the issues are so that the judge can make good scheduling choices. You know, at the very end, they said, this is going to be a two hour hearing. When you ask a judge for two to three hours of their court time, it better be something really serious. So I think what they were trying to explain is the complexity of it and why so much needs to go into it. Um, you know, I wrote down a couple of things that were said, and one of them was whether or not Judge Kai should be reading this, these emails, the substance of the emails. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of got the sense that they were somewhat okay with it. But, um, you know, they, she, she wanted to make sure she wanted to clarify uh, that she was going to do exactly what they're asking her to do. Because I think even a part of her is kind of like, I don't know if I should be reading these emails. And then um, part of the uh, what we thought we might hear is about Shanna Gardner's bond hearing. We still haven't heard about this bond. Is that just on hold for now, as far as we know? I think so. And a lot of times it's strategic where you'll fi file a bond a bond motion and knowing that all of this other information is going to come up that's going to undercut the strength of the case. So it's very possible that what they did is they filed the bond motion, got the judge thinking about it. And then they're as they're going through the motions of these other major issues, they're giving the judge to think about when they consider the issue of bond and why they should let them out on bond rather than filing it without going through all of this process. And then later the judge is like, oh, I see why maybe <laughs> I should have granted a, a lower bond in this case. Uh, by the way, um, STS is a community and I see that Space Coast on Discord, I don't even know what Discord is, but he's going to be having a an eclipse party today. I think it's 113 Eastern Standard Time. I know my kids are excited about that. Uh, sunny day here in Miami. So uh, if you want to hop on Discord whatever Discord is, uh, Space Coast is going to be organizing uh, an eclipse party. So there you go. Um, just to reiterate what this was all about. So Judge London Kite had basically asked 
for a special master, a judge named Robert Foster is a senior judge to help her figure out what's going on with this uh, privileged client, uh, attorney client information. And then uh, there was a motion filed last week and she said, basically, uh -uh, I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to handle it. Um, mm -hmm. So then these judges came back before her today and made their arguments as to what needs to be done. And so uh, she has decided she's going to break this into two different hearings, one for Shanna Gardner and one for Mario Fernandez Saldana. I'm just curious, Shannon, why is she deciding to sever it here in terms of hearing mm -hmm. two separate arguments? Okay, so I had to go pull up the motion, but basically we have um, two two issues. So a violation of the privilege, like they had the privilege and you heard Christina Stifler talking, the prosecutor talking about, um, she didn't tell me what she saw, meaning this Lindsay Butler, this ATF agent, she didn't tell me what she saw when she was going through the documents, only that she believed she was reviewing confidential documents. Doesn't matter. The state is the state is the state. Doesn't matter if they were using federal process or federal investigators, like the knowledge that a, the lowest law enforcement officer has all the way to the elected state attorney, that is the knowledge of the state, like all encompassing. So, you know, looking at these arguments, Patrick Carodi for Shanna Gardner is arguing that they had it. And then what uh, Fernandez's office is actually arguing is more of a taint issue, that there was actually... Um, you know, this has tainted the prosecution. And the the motion that was adopted by both parties makes both arguments. But I think what, what they were talking about in this hearing is that the evidence that was possibly seen based on these depositions, they didn't specifically ask, what did you read? Just which of these documents did you see? And that's the reason that they're not going to have this in-camera hearing where they're going to have to ask this federal investigator specific questions about what she saw because those deposition transcripts could end up in a in a docket somewhere. So as the defense attorney, they're trying to balance not revealing the confidential communications with arguing that the state should be disqualified. And it's a really delicate balance. And I think that's why it's, you know, people are like, why are they ruling on this? Because it is so methodical. Mm -hmm. So help me break this down. Um, if I understood Judge London Kite correctly, she says that Shanna Gardner is going to have a status hearing on April 10th, which is actually, I think, two days away. It's going to be yeah. on Wednesday. And then she's trying to do an in-camera hearing on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And then on April 19th, that's the hearing regarding this. Do I have that right? Yes. So, you know... Judge Kite really likes to run a tight ship. So she's saying, like, I don't have a trial. Let's see if we can get this done. So what she wants the state and the defense to do is to figure out if they can even have this in-camera hearing and then to report back. So it may be, um, you know, on, on Wednesday, the plan might change. But as of right now, she's tasking the state and the defense to try to get the wheels moving so that they can get, take care of this. Wow. So that's three, possibly three hearings over the next like two weeks, basically. So the way that Duval County works is we all go to court nine to noon every day, Monday through Thursday. And then Fridays are the days where you have like specific hearing dates. But so the judge's courtroom is what we call up every day. And they're they're in court nine to 12. So if there's something that needs to happen, they just need to check in, have a quick question answered. They'll just bring people back. And then again, you know, a lot of those private attorneys, myself included, if we're like in a rush, the prosecutor's there, I'm there, but my client's like in the shoot and you got to bring the men out and then you got to bring the women out. Like female inmates cases can take significantly longer to call because they've got like 50 men and three women and they only, they share a shoot. So they have to like move things around. So a lot of times they'll just wave the appearance. They'll pr approach for like five minutes handle what they need to handle and then come back. So it's not as um, in scheduled, I would say, as like the April 19th and the May 3rd. That will be a day when only they are scheduled. And then a lot of people have been asking, what's the deal with Jose Baez? He's getting paid gobs and gobs of mm -hmm. money, but you've got Patrick Karate there. Uh, well, why, does Jose, why does Jose Baez not show up for these? 
I mean, he lives in Orlando. Like he practices in Orlando. Patrick Carotti is local. People need to know Patrick Carotti's name, right? Like he's the brains behind this operation. Like he's a very, very good lawyer. And just because he doesn't go onto national television and showboat doesn't mean he's not like an excellent attorney. And I think, you know, one of the first questions someone asked me when I was talking about this case on our local news is like, oh, wow, Jose Baez is in this case. I'm like, for as an attorney, like he is not as impressive to me as someone like Patrick Corotti, who's just like a brilliant legal mind and who really understands like all of the constitutional rights his client has, is a very good research and writer. You know, it's just, it's, it's one thing as an attorney, as a judge to be impressed. And it's another thing to like see people on TV and granted, like, I do that too. I go on TV and yeah, like I want people to be impressed by that. But the secret is like, it's really not that impressive to be like a loud personality. Um, when you're in these issues, when your client's constitutional rights are being, being violated, you know, it's about those legal minds and it's just not as sexy as Jose Baez, but Patrick Crody is a great lawyer and he should really be a household name. There you go. Uh, Patrick Crody, remember the name. Um, but uh, today, once again, Jose Baez not there uh, per in person, and you hear you heard why. They're a team. Yeah. They're a team. I'm sorry, I need to say yeah. that they are a yeah. team. Yeah, and um, here we go. Aria Dakota Grimaldi Lane. I really hope this trial doesn't get delayed. We don't have um, mm -hmm. a trial date. Do you get the sense now that these? Two cases will be severed that they will be tried separately is there any way to i don't know do you have a do you have a gut feeling one way or the other so we have courtrooms in duval county that can accommodate a bifurcated trial i think that they will try to try them together if it stays in duval county they're going to make every effort to try them together especially in light of the sensitive nature of this case, the fact that they're bringing a cooperating witness in from prison, you know, there's a lot of logistical issues. So I think that they really will try to try them together, but they're going to get two juries and they're going to be in a ceremonial courtroom with two jury boxes. They're going to be moving the juries in and out. Um, we just saw this, this happen locally in the JEA trial with um, the former CEO and CFO of our local electric utility, they did the same thing. They had two different juries and it was logistically hard, but not as difficult as trying this case twice. So I, I think we'll get a trial date. There's a lot of issues and this case is already very delayed, right? You're supposed to have a trial within six months. That's your right to a speedy trial. Nobody's ready. Like no one's even near ready. Right now they're, they're having, they're doing depositions about whether or not their Sixth Amendment rights were violated, not who did you see, what did you see, what happened. Um, that being said, I think it's telling that these defense attorneys are spending so much time on whether or not the state investigated this correctly, because, you know, when you don't have the facts, you argue the law and they're arguing the law. So it's like, I don't think that there's any rush to get into a courtroom and argue the facts of whether or not this happened. I think that, you know, it's very unlikely there will be a trial if they lose these issues. Look at this, Bernie. Uh, heaven, love this guest. Shannon Shot is her name. Comprehensive explanations we can all follow. Thank you. That's why we have the best guests in true crime. Tim Jansen, by the way, just hopped on for a few. He was running uh, into court. Speaking of uh, court, um, that's where he is spending his morning. He is a practicing attorney. Um, so both Shanna Gardner and Mario Fernandez Saldana, and I'll get to this question in a moment, are facing first degree murder charges. Uh, in the death of uh, Shannon's ex-husband, Jared Bridegan, both have pleaded not guilty. How does it work, Shannon? They want to know with two different juries. How does that work? So when you <clears throat> when you have two different juries, when it's not bifurcated, um, you are not severed, excuse me, then they have to, they call like a, hundreds of people. And you go through the jury selection process and both sides, like, so the state... And I've done this before, but basically like you have one side that's picking a jury first, and then you have another side that's picking a jury, but you're listening to all of the jurors, potential jurors in the venire answer the questions. Um, this will be a case that we're going to have to call significantly more. Normally they can pick a homicide jury out of like 48 people. And we do it 
by sevens, I think, or by, yeah, we, we have it by sevens. So, um, you know, they can pick a, a homicide jury out of very few people, but in this case, they're going to have to have like several hundred people and they're gonna have to pre-qualify them. And it's going to be a little chaotic and they'll probably use our ceremonial courtrooms to pick the juries as well. Cause they're a little bit bigger. So, um, you pick the juries and I, I like I can't get into how it all works, but basically like think of the jurors in a number line. And so like you start with one and either you pick them or you strike them. And so like you'll m make the first jury and then you'll be at probably juror number 100 and then you'll make the next juror jury, but you'll pick it all together and then you seat them in two different jury boxes. And if something is hearsay for one defendant, but it's not for the other, they'll take the jury out that can't hear the hearsay and then they'll like switch them back and forth. But some of the testimony they can both hear and they'll just be sitting there and then they'll deliberate in separate jury rooms. So they'll actually get separate instructions. They'll deliberate in separate rooms. It takes a very long time, not a very long time. Relatively speaking, it takes longer to do this, but it just ensures that the two defendants get a fair trial. Um, and interestingly, again, we just had a case locally where this happened. The two juries, they deliberate in a vacuum. They don't know what the other jury is doing. And one person was acquitted and one person was found guilty. And it like really doesn't matter for their individual cases. Like, oh, this person was found guilty. And so I should be not guilty. Also, it really doesn't matter. Mm. Uh, by the way, speaking of uh, jurors and juries, Chad Daybell, uh, we've been following mm -hmm. that trial uh, gavel to gavel, we're in the second week, and they are still in jury selection at, as it is as, uh, a potential death penalty case. And today, uh, Judge Boyce announced that they're going to be doing uh, continuing the voir dire process, but this is the jury pool uh, in there. So these are all potential jurors now. So he is not streaming it. So mm -hmm. it will not be streamed today, but uh, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, they will actually have a, a seated jury uh, tomorrow, the next day, and we will be back uh, and ready for opening statements. So follow me at Podcast STS on Twitter, at Podcast STS on Twitter. And uh, Little Lamb is saying that right here. Uh, we will get Daybell openings uh, tomorrow. Uh, so uh, we are hoping for that. You can also follow me on Instagram at Surviving the Survivor, where I put up uh, show times and shows. And speaking of that, uh, today, I believe at five, either five or seven, we are still following that really troubling case uh, out of Oklahoma, the two missing moms who are actually from Kansas. This this is the panhandle area of Oklahoma. We're going to be following that case. Uh, my friend Laura Engel is actually out there for News Nation, and I'm hoping to get her uh, to hop on, but we'll be following uh, the missing Kansas moms in Oklahoma. And now authorities there are saying that they believe foul play is involved. It is rare for two mothers to go missing simultaneously. Uh, so this makes it um, a very intriguing case. Again, at either five or seven today, follow me on Twitter at podcast STS on Instagram at surviving the survivor uh, Shannon from Annie K. And then we will slowly start to wrap this up. Shannon, would the state ever want to make a deal to have Mario Fernandez Saldana turn on Sarah, uh, Shanna Gardner for a lesser sentence rather than having two concurrent trials? Good question. Yeah, and I think going back to what I said earlier, you know, they're arguing the law here. I don't think they really want to argue the facts. And it appears that they are working together. The two defendants are working together right now. But you always have in the back of your mind that one might have to, for their own sake, plead or make a deal. But what I really think is going to happen here, the word on the street in our community is that these two defendants were overcharged. Um, I understand what they did, but to, to charge them with first degree homicide, to seek the death penalty is really extreme. And it's very likely that they will both come to the table with an offer to enter pleas to a lesser included charge and certainly to take the death penalty off and that there will be a simultaneous negotiation to resolve both. I could see that happening. Um, one of the uh, more recent pieces of news too, and I'm just wondering if we know anything more about it and by we, I mean you Shannon about the fact that there is now uh, five co-defendants in this case. Um, 
you know, originally it was the three, it was Shanna, Mario, and of course, Henry Tenen, the admitted trigger man. But do we know anything about these other two additional two co-defendants in this case? Well, let's see, because I haven't seen the latest headline, but I, I was, I did watch the news report when Melissa Nelson said that she would, you know, charge every co-defendant and I don't want to slander anyone's name, but if I had to think of two more people who could have been involved in this, the two people who bankroll Shanna Gardner's life would come to mind. And allegedly, and I have no proof of this, I have no knowledge of this, but there are two people who bankroll Shanna Gardner's life and everything she's done, marrying Jared Bridegan, marrying Mario Fernandez Saldana has been... Um, motivated by her relationship with these two people. So I could see how similarly to the Adelson case, um, you know, there could be some familial relationships with potential new co-defendants that could mm. very be, very well be possible. Uh, interesting. So uh, once again, uh, just to recap what happened today, uh, it's kind of like deja vu all over again, as uh, Yogi Berra said, but um, essentially the defense is claiming that attorney client privilege information, um, was mishandled by the state. And as a result, they want the state, uh, and their team, uh, to be removed from this particular case. Judge London M. Kite said, look, we'll get a special magistrate in here. Uh, that special magistrate was assigned. And then there was a motion filed last week and the judge said, uh, today, Judge Kite, uh, look, I'm going to handle this now. I don't need this special magistrate. And so now Judge Kite has broken this up into several different hearings. As I understand it, April 19th will be um, Shanna Gardner's hearing on this. May 3rd, Mario Fernandez Saldana's uh, hearing. It'll, these will be all morning, three to four hour hearings. What should we expect for that? Shannon, for these longer three hour hearings, what will the defense, what will the state present at these hearings? So they're really going to get into the meat of the arguments. They're going to talk specifically about that motion that was filed several weeks ago. They're going to make arguments about how the state is tainted and how they, they cannot unring this bell. Um, and they will, you know, whether or not they read every single communication, the fact that they have them is enough for them to be disqualified. Um, and then they're going to, you know, have to convince the judge. I don't expect Judge Kite to make a ruling from the bench. I think that she will take it back. She will spend several weeks um, and she will ultimately do a written order because she knows that this is going to be exhibit A in the appeal. And then again, you know, it's important that people understand the the reason this case may be tried is to preserve all of their rights on appeal for all the work that's happening right now. And then uh, the $64,000 question, if we had to take a, an educated guess on when this trial actually begins, when do you think that might be? I mean, again, they're not even getting into the prospect of, um, the facts of what happened here. You know, they're really not doing discovery on who did what, when, where. And I just want to clarify. Okay. So <laughs> KLC, I didn't say anyone's name. Um, I'm just saying, if you ask me who else could be involved, like that's what comes to mind. Um, but I just pulled up the article and there were two other co-conspirators named, um, I'm referring to a News for Jack's article where they believe that a former reservist and convicted felon might have been involved. Um, this is related to the fact that they never recovered the gun. So I don't I did not say anyone's name. I don't want anyone to be unclear that, you know, when you ask me who might else who else might be involved, like I'm just saying that's what I think of as an individual and I'm not alleging anything. Um, but, you know, uh, they're really not even talking about like who did what. So they have a lot of work to do and there's a lot of witnesses involved. There's this co-conspirator or this, you know, Henry Tennant, they're going to have to depose him. Uh, they're going to have to get into bank records. You know, there's a lot more work to be done and it would be 
it would not be fair to push this case to trial. So I would say 2025, if I had to guess. Wow, 2025, and it is basically the beginning of 2024. Midnight Rocker said you said April 10th. Well, there's m- multiple dates. There's a possible hearing this uh, April 10th, a couple, two days from now on Wednesday. Then there's a possible hearing on Thursday that we're going to find out about. And then for this particular issue of privileged information for Shanna Gardner, they're talking April 19th. So these are three different possible court dates that we are awaiting. And then for Mario Fernandez Saldana, Judge uh, London Kite said it would be May 3rd. So a lot happening, a lot going on. And uh, Space Coast telling me we're halfway through 2024. I wouldn't quite say that, but we're, I don't know, the first quarter, I would say. Is that right? First quarter, maybe. And uh, this likely will be, uh, as you just heard Shannon Schott say, uh, April, uh, the beginning of 2025. For those who do not know, Shannon Schott is a native of Jacksonville, Florida. She attended the Bowl School and matriculated at the University of Florida. She graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from there. Uh, she works with Belkis Plata. She went on to Stetson University College of Law, and uh, they practice law in the Jacksonville area. Uh, Shannon, your final thoughts today. Thank you for joining us. No, I don't want people to be disappointed that there wasn't a ruling today. I think we're going to hear a lot in these arguments, April 19th and May 3rd. It'll be very interesting. This is not an issue you see very often. So, hmm. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate you being yeah. here again. We'll be live today. Jennifer Jansen, thank you. Shannon, uh, we will be live later in the day, either 5 or 7. Follow me on Twitter, at Podcast STS. Follow me on Instagram, at Surviving the Survivor for show times and subjects. But we are looking to do the two missing moms uh, from Kansas who went uh, and disappeared seemingly into thin air uh, in Oklahoma, right in the Panhandle area, uh, where Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas all basically intersect. So follow us, follow us for that this evening. Until then. Love you, America. Love you, Jacksonville. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, let's think about Jared Bridegan today. He is the victim in this. We'll see you later in the day.